All right, it's a new day. A new day alive. What are you going to do with it today? I don't know what I'm going to do with mine. i got a lot to do. <laughs> anyway, update. So we left yesterday morning. Drove all the way in. Got to the hospital. Dropped her off the entrance. Then I took forever to find a parking spot. Left, brought the dog because I didn't know how it was going to work. I thought I was just going to drop her off. Walk her in and then off I went for the day or whatever, a few hours while she uh, had her surgery. But I ended up going up there with her and they got her into admitting or whatever it is, got her changed. <clears throat> and she came back out and we hung out and sat and waited and waited and waited and waited. I think we got there at 10 30 or something. We waited till apparently they're taking her in at 1 o'clock and we waited till 1 30. And then uh, I was out took the dog out for a walk in the parking lot and then i went around the block anyway i didn't realize we were going to be sitting there i thought I w otherwise i wouldn't have brought the dog and then um i went back up in there and she was gone and the woman sitting next said oh they took her in i'm like oh, okay here we go she was nervous of course right as anybody would be and then um uh, she texted me and said they canceled <laughs> canceled her freaking surgery after all that, five times now. So, there you go. That's the update. That really sucked for everybody. But oh well, right? I'll have to reschedule and then we'll have to go all the way in there, get blood work done again, and then go home and then wait. So, now i got to get caught up. Tell you what, man. I'm, yeah. I won't even talk about how backed up everything is on this end. I think it's just I think it's just a fact of life. People are ang angry at me daily because I, I don't or I can't get back to them in time or uh, whatever. Carrying on. Uh, one quick note. The positive side. She corrected me. There, is be there has been 19 children and 7 adults have been fed in one week from here. And that's not a meal. That's around a week's worth plus of groceries each family. There you go. Sarah's been covering everything like Tylenol for Tylenol for children. Formula, I guess that formula stuff is freaking expensive, but she's she got that too. And uh, lots of healthy food. Diapers, wet wipes, baby wipes, whatever. It's good. It's working. And it's funny too, quick note on that. I'm going to say right now, it's too bad. You know, once I realized the power of what you can do, what a handful of people can do, and, I mean, there is no question about it around the globe. The Western countries, anyway, the quality of life is non-stop spiraling. It just is. The club, there is a club in politics. You have to be one dark son of a bitch to be in this club today, and the we are uh, we're seeing the results of that now. But anyways, what I'm getting at is, just to feed homeless people, feed not just homeless people, hungry people. It made me realize, you know, to turn this around is too bad. Let's just picture this for a second. It's too bad. You couldn't take like a community. And I don't mean a handful of farms and growing gardens and shit. I mean a community like this small town I'm living in. Block the road off in a way. Have a town meeting and decide what's going to happen in your community. Period. Wouldn't that be great to be able to do that? Decide what's going to happen in your community, period, across the board. And then expand from there and start all over. And do not include the shit bags when it comes to the people. Wouldn't that be great? I wonder how hard that would be. All right, there we go. Moving along. Who do we got? What do we got? Photo. Mark, this is red. New clear photo. Steve, this clear photo of a Sasquatch is burning up the internet. Experts are saying it's legit. What do you think? Do you know of it? Have you seen it? Thanks for what you're doing, Mike. All right. Um, one thing I, I try to get everybody to not do is is uh, jump on my bang, bandwagon anytime for anything. Go with your gut and make your decision for you on anything. Um, so what's let's have a look. 
I'm gonna tell you my I'm gonna tell you my honest reaction right off the bat. Not that I want I don't want to get into this. I am not a critique of photographs like some other people on the spend of they're they're trying to create a business of doing that for themselves online. <clears throat> All right, and that's not me ever. This looks like a substantial photograph. I'll put it back, I'll put it up, I'll put it in the video. Origins unknown. <clears throat> I don't know what do I ha what do I think about this right off the bat? All right, looks like a pretty good photo. Looks clear. Looks like the, the face has been perfectly focused on with a uh, professional camera because it goes out of focus once you get to the top of its forehead to the back of its hair. Leaves in the front or out of focus. Leaves in the back are out of focus. That means whoever took this photo took the time to perfectly focus on this image past the leaf screen which for me i'll call myself a wildlife videographer photographer that's not easy to do it takes a little bit of time <laughs> first off i'm gonna i'm gonna do this just for fun we'll go down this photograph with what i think just for fun just this one time so picturing me i'm looking at this being looking at me I've had something rising up out of the bushes in front of me with a camera on the tripod. And I, it takes a lot for me to get unnerved in the wilds. And uh, I instantly didn't even think there was a camera beside me on a tripod first off. And that was at around 150 yards away from me with a high power rifle in the grass. I didn't think for a second about that camera when that was going down. And uh, so... First off, as soon as I see somebody with a close-up photograph who has the focus perfect on the image that close, all right, that's a red flag just for me. Now, what else? Does this look like anything I've seen? I haven't seen the face of one of these beings. I saw the crisp outline myself, the silhouette. So let's go down from what all of the people have shared here. Super wide mouth. Not on this thing. Super wide, large, bulbous nose. Not on this image. Eyes huge, huge dark eyes, super wide apart. Not on this image. <laughs> there you go. My gut screams, yeah, good one, but not quite so good. Right? Too many red flags. The cheeks go out. That's just like, obviously, for me. This is a photograph of a gorilla, which has been enhanced to have a somewhat of a different look to his face. How confident am I in that? Uh, if I had the money, I'd throw down a million dollars of my money, if I had it, that this is generated by a human being. There you go. My main reason, though, is because of all you, the people. All right? The strong, strong pattern is absolutely huge a super super wide mouth abnormally wide mouth huge dark eyes wide flat huge bulbous nose this image has none of the above there you go so that's my take on the photo <laughs> but hey maybe i'm wrong but i doubt it Okay, moving along. Thanks for that, man. And please, everybody, uh, I'm not going to make a habit of doing that with photographs, all right? Myself. I'm beyond the photograph thing. Unless somebody has to share a photograph with all of you, I'll share it with you. But for me being a, a photograph video critique expert, no, yeah, it's not my forte. But I can make decisions for myself. Now, excuse me. Moving along. This is titled South of Ireland. Hi, Steve. Please don't say my full name. I got gotcha. you. My surname would be known. And I'm not ashamed, but I can see my family saying, here we go again. <laughs> okay, man. Tell you what. Share some of these videos with your family. All right. I followed you from the start. It made so much sense. and I knew what the people were saying was true. And I was not alone. Now my experiences. First experience was not seeing us sabe. It was like a time warp. We were on the way home. We've been up the country and we cut across the Mallow C.O. Cork to Mitchell Stone. 
Maybe you meant Mitchell's Town, but it's, it's spelled Mitchell and then S-T-O-W-N. I'm guessing Mitchell's Town. We had done this journey often. It was back counter roads, just room enough for two cars to pass. There was high walls on the right side of the road, and it was a normal day. As we came to a corner and had to slow down, the wall on the right had dropped down to a lower fence. As the car turned the corner on the right side, we saw was a sheer cliff straight up and stopped to look. It was, it was black jacked rock, wet, and leaned over to try to see the top. My husband and my five kids were all overlooking to see what we were excited about. At the top was like clouds pouring down over the top, and there was like a black smoke puffing down through it. We were mesmerized at this so strange place in front of us. Because we were on the corner, two cars were honking, their horns to move out of the way. We had no choice but to move. My husband said he was going to turn around and go back. We found a place, turned around and went right back. Steve was just a flat field. No sign of what we had just witnessed. I was questioning myself. My husband said it was there and two of my older children said it was there. It was just unbelievable. For a long time, we talked and questioned each other. Believe me, it was there. We never, we, wherever we went after that, at home or abroad, I looked to see any place that would look like it, somehow. When we were in Hawaii, I think the stone, there was a bit like it, Okay, there's a little bit of typos here, okay? You guys are going to be a little, a little difficult, but we'll get it. When we were in Hawaii, I think that the stone there was a bit like it, but it was not as black as what we saw in Ireland. This was the first time we saw something out of the ordinary that would have been in the early 80s. And that would have been in the early 80s. Next time we saw something would have been in the late 80s. It was a winter evening snow it was starting just lightly to fall. We lived near the mountains. We decided we'd better get extra food in before it was too bad to travel. It's funny how that does with snow. Eh? The snow even drizzles here and the grocery stores go off. The light was starting to go, so we were careful driving the narrow country road. We were just talking and watching the road as we went. As we came to the bridge, we slowed down where we were taking the turn right. As we got on the straight, short part of the road, I saw this big person walking on the side of the road. I was shocked at how tall this person was and wearing a fur coat. I didn't say anything. I was just trying to make sense of what I was looking at. And right then I see the headlights of the car right on it. My husband had turned the car to see. He said, he said nothing. Okay, hold on. There's no commas for the sentence. I'll read it one more time. I'm sorry, you guys. Right then, I see the headlights of the car right on it. My husband had turned the car to see. He said nothing, and I didn't say anything. I was so frightened at this huge person. Now we had nowhere to go. We went to pass this thing, and it was almost the width of the car. He was huge, Black long hair all over, almost as wide as the car. Think about that one. Think about that one. Sorry. Now we had nowhere to go. Went to pass this thing and it was almost the, almost the width of the car. It was huge, long hair all over. It stopped and turned to the top part. It stopped and turned the top part of his body around, looked over his shoulder at us. We had no choice but to pass it. We were close. He would have put his hands on us on us. We passed it. It towered there's a whole pile of typos, and to the person who emailed in, don't feel ashamed, it's okay. It's just a little awkward, but we'll get it. So I got to put the sentences together a few times here. The words, we passed it. It towered over the car. My husband drove as fast as he could. 
It was then the two of us shouted what the... What shouted, what was that? He went so fast, we almost crashed into the wall at the T-junction. We were now at the other side of it. The town of Fermoy and had to get back home. I will never forget that night. We were, we told our family what had happened, but we were laughed at. It was so hurtful to be laughed at and asked, what were we smoking? I'm 74 now, but it took the wonderful pleasure we had walking through the woods. Okay, I think he meant it took away the pleasure of you being able to walk through the woods. We never did that again. Oh, that sucks, doesn't it? My husband died of cancer. I miss him, but we knew what we saw. I wish he had lived to see your program and all the wonderful people of the round table. I got my mug from Sarah. Give her my love, and for you, Steve, my love and respect for all you do for us. I do hope you can understand my spelling. I'm not great, but I know what we say, and no one can ever make me say otherwise. Stay safe, Steve, and love to Sarah at all at the round table. All right, I appreciate you so much for sending that email in to us. Absolutely appreciate you. I'm sorry about your husband's passing, and I'm also just as sorry that you lost your love for walking in the woods. That's why we're here. That sucks. That's not fair. That's bullshit. But we're getting everybody educated up, right? As much as we can. Ireland. There you go, Ireland. That's not the first time Ireland has has informed the world through us that this is being, this is happening there too, right? Not the first time. Keep them coming, all right? Keep them coming. Everybody, speak out loud and don't be afraid. No more being afraid. That's another reason why we're here. All right, excuse me. This is a long one. I'm going in. This is from the Owl Man. I've heard from the Owl Man for a little bit. What do we got? Titled Some Advice, a Book Recommendation, and Pam Porter from the Owl Man. All right, here we go. Hello, Steve. Blows an email I emailed to you in November 1. I added a few things to it, so disregard the original. Missed it, or I haven't got to it yet. And November is tough too, right, man? As November, I'm running around the forest full time. Greeting Steve, I thought I would drop another email in to you in hopes it will help you and the others. Enclosed is a picture of a book I think everyone should read. It's called The Sense of Being Stared At and Other Aspects of the Extended Mind by Rupert Sheldrake. Right on. Sounds good to me. I think it will give everyone in this in this interest, a better understanding of the suppressed capabilities of our brains. Sounds like a book that should be stuffed in every school on the planet. This author wrote another book worthy of time called Dogs That Know When Their Owners Are Coming Home. Both books will give a plausible understanding of how it's possible for the Sabe to do some of the things they do. The books have nothing to do with the wild people, but it di does give insight to the unseen abilities of not just us, but some of the animals we are connected to. Yeah, how the hell do they do that, right? How many times, I remember uh, a while, quite a while ago, hearing of family pets that literally made it numerous states across North America to find their family at their new home and found them. What? How crazy is that? Fish making it back up in the same river after going and growing off the coast of Japan, Alaska? Etc. Etc. There's a lot of shit going on out there that's pretty, pretty something else. On a more somber note, you read the story of Pam Porter, the young lady that died of a rare cancer. I met Pam once, sometime in 09 or 2010. I spent about five hours sitting with her in the dark with three others, including myself. At the time, I knew the young man who was romantically interested in her, and he was an investigator for the organization that shall not be named. Right on. That young man was aware of my dealings with the Sabe, and he brought her to experience what myself and my friend were doing. I remember her telling the story about her mysterious blood loss. She appeared to be in good health at the time. 
She was a charming young lady, and when I had heard of her ultimate... Un, sorry, she was a charming young lady, and when I had heard of her untimely death, I was deeply saddened by it. Apparently, it was a rare type of cancer that claimed her life. At the time, I found it to be rather odd, but I now seem to know a few others who had come down with unexplained sickness after having close encounters with these beings. It's been many years now, but like you, I am starting to put some things together. The late Mary Green once told me not to handle the Sabe's feces because it will make you very sick, and the doctor will not be able to find any pathogenic cause. I remember her telling me that telling me the sickness seemed to last a long time, and if I recall, one or two others who helped her collect that sample had the same symptoms. Looking back at it, I suppose it could have been a mild form of radiation sickness. Have you ever considered why the Sabe avoid us? Are they aware that somehow they may cause illness or death? I guess that is something I should ask them in the future. I spent a lot of time in close contact with them over the years, and yet never had any type of health or disorientation from them. I guess time will tell. The rest of this email is rather long, and it pertains to these beings around your home when you are not there. I hope it'll help you and others understand a little about how their minds work. It's long, but an easy read. Okay, man, strapping in, here we go. I recently read your community note from November 17th, 2023. It seems you have a bit of a problem on your homestead when you leave for extended periods. I'm not Scott, Car Scott Carpenter, nor do I want to be his replacement. Scott and myself had a very similar journey going on around the same time. I just went a different direction than he. He more or less did his best to distance himself from these wild people, while I wanted to understand more about them. So let me try to help you and the others who find themselves more or less pissed off with, the coming, with them coming around the home. Some of the stuff will sound familiar because it is information I've mentioned before, and some of it is from Scott as well. The Sabe are an ancient people with ancient ways. What I mean by this is they have kept their way of life the same for thousands of generations while we advanced our ways forward because of technology. Technology alters our cultures and belief systems to a high degree. For the Sabe, this is not the case. They have an understanding of old ways the ways many of our ancient ancestors knew so long ago, long before institutionalized governments. This is why the Sabe seem strange to us. Let me explain. The Sabe are a covenant people. The word covenant has lost all meaning in modern Western culture. We just define covenant as an agreement. But in a world before lawyers, a covenant was much more than that. It was an agreement where life and death were exchanged for generations in the future. When you agree to a covenant agreement, you tie up your entire tribe or clan with life and death. Let me explain. In ancient cultures, it was common to form agreements with neighboring people groups for survival. This was long before we decided to go urban. This was about hunting, gathering, and early farming. Say you have one clan of people who are great at gathering and producing food. Over the hill, you have another clan that are incredible warriors and protectors but they are not so good at feeding themselves. Likewise, the farming group is not so good at protecting themselves. So the two leaders of each tribe come together and form a covenant together. The warriors pledge to protect the farmers in times of need, and the farmers pledge to feed the warriors in time of need. To seal this agreement, they would cut some part of their body, usually the palm of their hand, let it bleed, and they would either bind their hands to gather the blood to gather so the blood would mix, or they would let each one's blood drip into a cup and mix it with water or wine and drink it. This is where we get the term blood brothers from. When this was done with the palms of the hands, the wounds were deliberately rubbed with dirt or ash, which resulted in a very visible scar. All the people from both tribes or clans did this. Why? Because in times of conflict, if two people from both tribes raise their hands to see the scar, they instantly have to stop the nonsense and honor the covenant their people made. Oh, there you go. Now the, the crowd's going to roar up. Some of the crowd, right? There seems to be a large amount of people out there that believe that when, they, when the past people on the earth raised their hands, it was to show they had five fingers and not six. 
Then other people say they raised their hands to show they had no weapon. Now this is the first I've heard of this one. And I'm not saying it's not true, and I'm not saying I don't believe it. I'm just saying. We've had a few variations of why the hand is raised. When you made a blood covenant like this, it was an oath each other could not break without deadly consequences. It was so serious that the above scenario I mentioned, the farmer's tribe would starve in order to feed the warrior tribe, and likewise, the warriors would give their lives defending the farmers. Covenants were not meant to be broken, and were supposed to be binding forever or death, depending on the conditions agreed to. Let me give you some examples of blood covenant agreements. In the Old Testament of the Bible, you have most notably Noah, who offers animal sacrifice after the flood. You have Abraham, who cuts several animals in half in a ritual where he and God are supposed to walk through, but he falls asleep, and God himself walks through. Then circumcision was demanded of all of Abraham's descendants. In the New Testament, Jesus is the blood sacrifice to save his people where he wears the scars of his sacrifice forever. I use these examples because as modern Western people, we no longer see covenant agreements as bonding or sacred. Excuse me. Remember how marriage was supposed to be a covenant agreement till death do us part? Well, you get the picture of how it means nothing anymore. I tell you all this to lay out, to lay a foundation of understanding of how the Sabe's people think. Despite all the weird abilities and high strangeness, they will understand covenant agreements. If you recall in one of my other emails, I mentioned that if you promise them something, you do not break it. I have no doubt one of the reasons so many of the Sabe do not like us or trust us is because in the past we have broken covenant agreements with them continually. If you promise never to take a picture of them, don't do it. If you promise not to go past a particular boundary where they live, don't do it. Get the picture? It may not be a blood covenant, but your words have power and meaning, and that is important. True. I've heard that so many times, and that's one thing that's brought to light. is like the ladies, the superhero ladies, have showed me words have power. Your words have big power. Just simple words. Isn't that weird? Not weird, but... They say, the word in the street, words have big power. Remember Mike the rancher? He may not know it, but he entered into a covenant agreement with the Sabe on his land. This is what Scott Carpenter was missing. He didn't know or understand covenant agreements. Remember how Mike the rancher ends up with a dead mountain lion presented to him? He didn't realize it, but that is their end of the covenant covenant sorry, covenant agreement he cut with them. How does this relate to you and your home? Like it or not, Steve, you are the head of your clan. Everyone and everything on your homestead centers on you. You have the authority of all of it. Sorry, over all of it. The animals, land, Sarah, and everyone in the home, you determine the rules of your home and land. It is time you make a covenant with them. It is not complicated. It's not anything to be worried about. I promise you that you are most likely well known to all the Sabe in all the areas you roam around in. I can tell they seem to be very respectful of you, despite your ornery attitude towards them at times. They totally understand that their appearance freaks us out. We already have a foot in the door, like it or not, so here's my suggestion to cut a covenant with them. When you're at home at night and are aware of them being around... You walk your property and speak into the darkness of what you want respected. You have to take Sarah with you when you do this. They need to know she is your woman and you give her authority over your territory. Lay your ground rules down. Make it simple. No harm to any of the animals. Climbing on roofs, banging on the house. No things going on in the house. You may not be able to keep the orbs out. They have no control over most of that. It's a pretty bold statement. I'd like to know more about the orbs. You know what I mean? Like, and I'm not, I'm not uh, challenging your honesty here. What I'm saying is, you or anybody else can tell me they don't have much control over orbs. All right. How'd you find that out? And why is that? And what is an orb exactly? Where do they come from? What's going on in that department? See what I mean? I 
my brain goes, huh? You just told me, right? You just directly told me they have no control over the orbs. More on that one, right? More on that. For me. Sorry. <laughs> it's funny having a conversation with somebody with an email and they can't speak back. Add in no walking ar around the house, etc., etc. Tell them you do not want the women and children to be afraid. I think the reason they come around when you are not there is because they are not respecting the entire household when you are gone. Remember I mentioned many times they seem to be on some type of autistic spectrum. And that really messes up our perception of how they think and process things. So now that you lay out your terms of the covenant, they need something in return. Keep it simple. You will not shoot at them no matter where you are. You will leave them the gut pile of any animals you kill no matter where you are. When you dress out more meat birds, you take all those entrails somewhere else and dump them. Promise them you have no intention of purposely taking other people into areas you know they frequent. These are suggestions or examples of what you can offer. Whatever you do, just make sure it is something you can faithfully honor. I would suggest asking them to keep travelers or unknown, untrusted sabes away, and you want to be protected from them. They will honor that. That doesn't mean you will not have an incident here and there. Just like us, sometimes a kid or sneaky individual will try to break some rules. Once they are aware of any covenant breakers, they will deal with it. Here's the one drawback. You make a covenant with those who claim your home to be on their land, but they will probably not fly anywhere else you go. Each clan has a territory, and we have no idea what the boundaries or overlap is. But if my instincts are right, you have probably earned a degree of respect in all the places you haunt, and the word will get around that you made a covenant with a specific clan, and other clans will probably respect that. I hope all this information is helpful to you and the others who are living in the thick of them. I unknowingly made a covenant with them years ago. I've kept every promise I have made to them, and they were simple promises. Honestly, they have honored all of my terms. Maybe the downside to all this is me being tagged, but you are also tagged, and I suspect your entire household is as well. Nothing can untag you. Another thing Scott Carpenter didn't understand. You can rebuke things that the devil puts legal claims to by using Christ's name. Anything from the enemy can be rebuked and eliminated. Tagging from the Sabe can't, because they are not really demonic, as some think. Tagging is more of a way of being aware of who someone is and where they are and who is a threat and who is not. Some humans are tagged because, like it or not, they are deemed dangerous by the Sabe. Yet it makes no sense considering how you put it. Quote, they outclass us, end quote. Remember, they seem autistic in many ways. Logic and reason in the human mind doesn't always apply in trying to understand them. And like it or not, we share space with these people regardless of what others think. There are protocols in dealing with them when it is necessary. The real issue, we as a people, keep our word. When we have to deal with them, I cannot stress this enough. If they want to make your life miserable, trust me, they will. They are very good at driving people off of the land they buy and pay taxes on, and they will keep doing that no matter who buys that land. The Sabe know we are easily frightened and intimidated, even if we never see them. They are very tactical in dealing with us corporately and individually. I don't say this to scare people. I say all of this so everyone can go live their lives without living in fear of what may happen to them in the back of their minds. When anyone gives up the outdoors because they know of Sabes, they have become prisoners of themselves because their reality has been changed. I want to give people some hope in living in a new reality. Once again, Steve, thank you for taking the time to read, and may it be of value to all who have ears to hear. Yeah, old man. Appreciate it, man. Here's the book. The sense of being stared at. I'm interested in that myself. I want to enhance my my abilities, and I'm going to. I feel I am enhancing my own nonstop anyway. So there you go. Take from what what you will or leave it, you guys. But what the Owl Man, and yes, I do know his first and last name, but what the Owl Man's has shared 
does make a lot of sense to me and it has a, there's a there's a lot of patterns in what he has shared which has been shared by other people not related to him all right there's a lot of people out there who've taken some deep dives into the rabbit holes and spent literally years of intense studying and digging and looking years not just an hour of listening to all of us online and then waiting for tomorrow's new group of people to share what they know i mean these guys have keeping tracks keeping track of all of your experiences and they're as well non-stop digging for real like i mean digging anyways those people all have similar patterns which are, which are mentioned here and uh and we did walk the four corners sarah did all the the four corners of the property after the ladies came over and 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 uh spoke with us too on how to do that and for for the most part it seems to be working now the orb thing that's a different story <laughs> right both the kids and sir have seen the lights in the house i haven't and i don't know much about those myself i just know they're real without a doubt so uh what else have i been tagged i think do i believe i am tagged i don't know i've never really thought of of it that way i know they know i know call it tagged i guess if you want to call that tag this tagged i guess but i know they know i know um i've had a lot of people who know a lot and they all have the similar one similar pattern and what's what they share is the clan mention how these beings are in clans and they move around and that makes sense with the puzzles, the puzzle pieces I'm gathering. That makes sense to me. But there is another dark side that's con that is confusing. Now, I have heard that possibly there's some dark sons of bitches who are mixing up the DNA and creating other beings. Is that possible? Yep. Do I know that as fact? Nope. But I have heard that these, the dark side, meaning splicing DNA, creating something else, but in the in the form of these original large hairy people that these new ones have no respect and they don't have any rules apparently that's the word in the street i don't know have i ran into one no have i ran into somebody that's rented one of these beings that has zero rules kills people maybe possibly i don't know having a clue i don't have i haven't seen or heard of any evidence of these beings killing people heard stories Definitely heard a lot of stories, right? But do I know? I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, I'm babbling away. I got to stop thinking because my brain starts going. I want to think and look into something. Meanwhile, I got a whole audience sitting here waiting to, with people waiting to be heard. So appreciate you, appreciate you again, man. I'll be looking into that book. And make sure you email me again. All right. If you want to, if you want to, uh, emphasize more on the orb thing with the people through me please do because that's a there's a whole pile of questions right there's nothing but questions nothing but questions i want to hear but we're here you know like i always say for me this is what i believe or for me this is what i've seen this is what i know and i never i never try to make a bold statement so they don't know about orbs or they have no control over orbs Okay, said who? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And I'm, I'm not being, that's not an argument or belittling or a challenge. It's just like, that's con that's just me in on the conversation. My part of the conversation reply would be, how do you know that? Huh? How do you know that they don't, they have no control over these white balls of light? Give me some more info on that. That's all I'm saying. No. Follow up in regards to previous email. Okay, is this going to be shareable? All right, hold on. Have I read? Okay, hold, sorry. Let me read this again. Follow up in regards to previous email. Now you leave your name and the title. Savannah, Georgia. I'm going to leave out the name for now in case you say, don't use my name later on. Hi, Steve. Blank, blank. Here again. You read my story about a week ago. What's the date on this? This is a week ago. Okay. And one of, and one of my acquaintances reached out to me after hearing it. I had no idea he was following your channel. He said he was like, holy crap. 
blank his name so he felt the urge to reach out on facebook messenger in regards he asked not to mention his name as he is currently on uncle sam's payroll good guy tough no-nonsense sort of dude that i've shared a beer and banter with a few times he told me that i was not he told me that i was not bullshit and confirmed to me what i already knew Said he was once assigned for an exercise at on Fort Stewart two years prior as a mock infantry scout, though he is actually ranked as A3 or 3rd, 1st Lieutenant Artillery, or something like that. I'm not familiar with ranks, and it's not relevant. He told me he was assigned to be forward lead scout role for tank training near the same area. If you remember, as I mentioned previous, it's section off to check in and out of. He knows those sections qu slash quadrants better than myself. Said he was pissed because he had to put his feet in the mud when normally he's in the tank or mortar ops. He basically was pretty vague about it. But said he was walking on foot ahead of the tank, not right in front of it, but barely out of sight ahead and was to instruct the tank as to advance or hold, etc., over the comm. Like foot scout for the tank. He said there was a log, a big log, that he wouldn't have been able to even pick up, that was thrown, barely 30 yards ahead of him in the dirt, on the dirt road slash tank run. He stopped, then saw random blur, out of the corner of his eye. Quote, something really crazy fast, but it was gone before he turned to look, end quote. He radioed it over the comms, and they told him they're advancing regardless. He told me he then heard the loudest roar ever. It sounded like a lion crossed with a cheetah, but more human-like. So he freaked and started running toward the tank behind him around the corner. The tank came up and they told him to get in and actually turned around and doubled back. Then they radioed for helicopters over the area and two flew overhead not even 60 seconds later. That's weird, so I guess they're already in the air, right? Said they, his team, were told not to talk about the training exercise. But his CO interrogated him about what he saw. He told him about the log and that he just saw something move really fast out of the corner of his eye and didn't mention the roar to the CO. Said he's still freaked out by the roar slash scream he heard and will never forget it. This ended our conversation with, quote, dude, you were right. There's definitely a Bigfoot back there. You weren't tripping about it, end quote. And then asked me not to mention his name. It's crazy that an acquaintance of mine heard my story and already followed your channel because of that experience then wanted to tell me about that. Anyway, that's all there is. Just a little follow-up. God bless. Keep your ears up, Chris. Came in. Gotcha. There you go. It is amazing, right? There's a lot of people. Like, uh, I think one of the peak moments here in this channel, there is, we're averaging 7 to 10 million views a month. It's not quite that many yet, but it's in the millions. Right? There's a lot of people. That's a lot of freaking people, right? And when you take, uh, that's a lot. Of, who knows how many of those millions know what's up? And they un, maybe possibly, unfortunately, they feel they have a deep curiosity because of something they know is probably going around around the, where they live. And then uh, they're tuning in here nonstop to see if there's any anything going on near near where they are or similar to what they're seeing or hearing or experiencing, right? So yeah, it's a shit pile of people. And then a side note on that, on my social media, I don't talk about this. I don't talk about this this topic anywhere. On my, I just feed my outdoor stuff on this. I feed it onto the Instagram, which goes straight to Facebook. I don't go on Facebook, but I'm nonstop promoting the real world. Cool stuff they like to videotape and see. Fish and game, for the most part. But I don't talk about this. But when I make mentions on here, and then I see a lot of the names that reply to me from what I've said on here, I'm like, oh, holy shit. That's a lot of people from my social media that are hunters here in BC. And I always think that 
the majority of hunters probably think, oh, God, there he goes talking about stupid shit again. But meanwhile, there's a piss load of them who are actually interested in listening. I'm babbling. I hope it, made, hope it just made sense there. Probably not. No. What's this about? Sometimes I, I'll have a whole bunch of like political rants on here, which I do enough of, but sometimes I'll get a whole a whole uh, email on that, and then I'll refrain from sharing it here because that's not what this channel is about. All right, that wasn't for here. Okay, here we go. Here's a short. Here's another. Uh, hold on a minute. Julie, quote, turtle, end quote, Hogan's Sabe response. She's correct. In Hebrew, there are three words that in English are simply translated to man. They are, quote, Enosh, end quote, meaning man of lower order. Perhaps the, quote, made of earth, end quote, the Sabe spoke of, and generally describing a non-Adamic mankind. P.S. Adam was not created. If you read carefully, Adam was formed by the Father who breathed his own breath of life into Adam. Creation is a different operation. The angels are, the angels are also created beings. We, Adamites, actually carry the Father's DNA signature in ours. I'm not sure these beings carry that signature. Similar, but distinctly different. Adam, meaning those of Adam, formed of the Father, and considered a higher order of being than the Enosh. Ish, meaning simply man of, like man of this or that town. For instance, Judas Ishkariot. Actually, that means Judas, man of Kariot, a town of Edom, perpetual enemies of the Israelite tribes, which Jesus was the head of the Israelite tribes, whom Judas betrayed for silver. That Sabe female knows stuff. I can't wait to hear more. Thank you, Sharon. All right, there you go. We'll see what comes, Sharon. We'll see what comes. It seems just mentioning the Bible here in this channel when it comes to this topic or other topics can trigger some people. Don't know why. That's one thing I don't understand why people trigger online and lash out in a comment section anywhere. Just, it, it doesn't make sense to me at all. It's so freaking bizarre, right? Even right, even right down to uh, the music, but that shows me a side note on vibration. How everything's vibrating. Everything's a vibration. And it doesn't matter what, as an ex example of vibration, music. Music is a vibration, right? It's amazing how different people are, are vibrating at different frequencies. So some forms of vibration will take music. Actually, more specifically, as an example, take the opener music on some of my videos. It triggers people. That particular sound, song, vibration can and does trigger the odd person to lash out. That music sucks. I hate that song. <laughs> Isn't it bizarre? And then the next, and then a bunch of other individuals will love that song and love that music. Isn't it weird? But it's just the, the how we're built differently, I believe, and how that vibration of sound affects us. So that also may relate to why so many of us can or can not become aware of what's going on out there. We're at different, we vibrate differently. Our energy is vibrating differently, right? Easily proven by people's reaction to various music sounds, which are vibrations. Slight side note there. <laughs> really good babble day today, isn't it? Now, what do we got? Uh, a lot of stuff about the border, a lot of stuff about... What's this one? All right, this one starts off with a... Uh, this is a uh, 
reply to an email from 2022, and it also said that I have the title of the longest email I've ever read right away. So I just scrolled rip down, and this is a book. Too late in the day to start that one. Another time. All right, what's this one? Another book. What are the chances? What's this one? To... This one's manageable. Here we go. I got time for this one. I'm behind in everything. Black Panther slash Skunk Ape. It's house email. Steve, my name is Archie and you can use my name. I've got two stories to share. The location for both accounts are in the same general area in the in coastal Mississippi. Around Gaucher, Mississippi. This is on the singing river that flows into the Gulf of Mexico. A little history on the river. The stories have been passed down for many generations about the native peoples that live here when the first European explorers come, came in the 1600s. It is told the Spanish explorers tried to enslave the natives and take them back to Europe to sell as slaves. But after many were killed trying to defend their tribe, the rest of the tribe all joined hands and sang a song as they walked into the river, drowning, drowning themselves in the river rather than being enslaved by the Spaniards. Wow, that's dark, isn't it? It's said that on a quiet night, you can still hear them singing on the banks of the river, hence the Singing River. Wow. My grandfather built a camp house on that river in the early 1950s. The skunk ape encounter was told to me by my mother and uncle and occurred around 1957. They were in my grandfather's wooden boat with a Johnson outboard and my uncle took my mother and one of her friends upriver to a sandbar to swim. After they swam for a while, they decided to go further up the river to one of the basins to explore. At this time, there were no houses in this area, so they went to the head of the river basin where it flows in, unexplored territory for them. After about 10 minutes going upriver, they came to a large bend in the river with another sandbar. As they rounded the bend, they saw what they described as a small, hairy, black ape like creature around the size of a small child on two feet run up the sandbar into the woods beside the sandbar it climbed into a cypress tree and then was gone not much detail on what it looked like other than ape-like it scared my mom and her friends so badly that they made my uncle turn around and go back immediately when they got back to the camp house they told my grandparents what they had seen my grandfather told them it was probably an escaped monkey at the time, but no one really knew what they had seen, but he did believe them. They are both in their 80s and hardly remember details now, but I've heard the story many times over the years, and this was what I remembered from their account. Fast forward 1997, my youngest son, 10 years old at the time, and I were on our way to a weekend soccer tournament on the Mississippi Gulf Coast, and I told him we're going to save hotel money this weekend and stay at the old camp house on the Singing River. It was a Friday afternoon, about a two-hour drive from where we were living at the time. We didn't go down there until around nine o'clock that night. When we got about a quarter of a mile from the camp house, we saw what I thought at first was a big black dog standing on the right side of the road. It appeared to be eating roadkill. I hit the high beams and it jumped across the road in front of us in one leap cleared the road on the other side and leapt again and was gone solid black head was square and the tail was about three feet long my son asked me what that was and i told him it was a big cat i've seen bobcats before along with all of the usual animals that live in the woods of mississippi growing up and hunting all my life and this thing was probably 80 to 100 pounds and had a shiny black coat it was definitely a black, large cat. The next morning as we left out, I stopped where we saw it, and the roadkill was all but gone. Where it had leapt to was a bayou. The closest tree was about 15 feet from the road, but water everywhere. But water everywhere else surrounding it. I heard you read the story about the black panther in the, in the Honey Island Swamp, Louisiana. The other day so i decided to chime in and tell my account which is about 100 miles from where that happened we got to the soccer game 
and I told some of the soccer parents about what we saw and got the eye rolls you'd expect. I got the knee-jerk reply about there not being any Panthers in Mississippi, and especially not black ones. I told my co-workers on Monday about what we had seen, with mixed reviews on, on whether they believed it or not. My supervisor called his sister, who was a biologist at one of the colleges in Mississippi, and she told him that we probably just saw a huge house cat, and there aren't any black panthers here in North America continent. <laughs> wow. That always makes me laugh, I'll tell you why in a minute. That's pretty much the reaction that most people give you when when you see something that they don't understand as we have seen on your channel. Thank you, Steve. God bless. Thank you. To, yeah, thank you, too. Appreciate you sending that. That's a crazy story about the singing river. Holy crap, that's sad and dark. Ooh. People people can be nasty, right? Slavery. Jesus. Now, a uh, quick note on the Black Panther thing. I have a friend of mine in Tennessee, who's seen one in Tennessee, saw it. Ando story. He told me he saw it. You saw it. We've got a lot of people chiming in about seeing black cats and even in the UK. Now, do I think it's a uh, spiritual thing? Ghost-like thing? Nope. I believe they're absolutely real. Now, here's the deal. <laughs> it always makes me laugh when somebody gets the title of biologist. <laughs> right. You might as well have the title of paper boy when I hear that. I don't give a flying shit, especially what I know now. What I know now as truth and is truth it doesn't matter what human classroom gave you the title of your name when it comes to the real world. Don't matter. You have been misled and bullshitted through your entire <laughs> journey to get those letters put in front of that title in your name. Prove me wrong. Anyway, so is it funny how so I'm a biologist? I can tell you right now they're not anywhere in North America. Or really because you have been in every place in North America at the same time. <laughs> right, so you can dictate that bullshit statement to us. But here's the deal. If anybody's curious and you live in the South where these black cats are being seen, now, so you know, yes, I'm a licensed trapper, and I have trapped the shit out of a pile of wolves. I, I've been guiding professionally for big game in North America for a lot of years. I know my game. Only because of my first-hand experience in the real world, not in the classroom. Now, um... Cats are probably one of the easiest of the predators to bait in. Okay? Uh, grizzly bears, wolves, you can do it, but they're not that easy. Black bears, black bears are about as smart as a pickle. Grizzly bears, as an example, I'm just going to give you the rundown for all you in the South who, are, who might want to try this. I, I, if I was living in the South, I would get that video trail camera photograph of a black panther. I would get it. I guarantee you I'd get it because I wouldn't stop till I got it. And I got the experience to pull it off. Now, as an example, we'll shoot a moose in the north. Middle of nowhere. Grizzly bears everywhere. We'll shoot a, a moose in the north. Strip all the meat off of it. And we'll leave the carcass. Like meaning the ribs. The hip bones. The leg bones. Uh, the gut pile. And and we'll ride by it on our horses to go hunting for the next days on end. Up to weeks. And I'll tell you what. We, we have gone easily a week, two weeks. And not even had of, of no predators hitting that carcass. Except for eagles and ravens. And they clean it up real fast. But I'm just saying, sometimes a grizzly bear won't even go near it. Just won't go near it. Wolves, same thing. Wolves will go, as soon as a wolf senses danger from humans anywhere, they're done. They're done. I've seen wolves, as an example, I've dropped, I dragged a steer up an old logger road one time with my snowmobile. Heavy. Barely made it. Because it kept on bogging down the snow on the trail. And then, um, anyways, finally got up to where I wanted to to get it. I couldn't get it off the trail. Just dumped it right there. Spun around and left. About a week later, a week later, a whole steer lay there on the trail in the winter. I went back up and a pack of wolves came down the road, split in half and went around that steer. It didn't even stop and smell it and kept on going. And I think it was over a week, almost two weeks later, the bird's been hammered on it. Two weeks later, the wolf, same pack, wolf pack came back. They ate everything. <laughs> Weird, right? But anyways, another time I had a whole pile of rotten, disgusting, rotten, absolute, the nastiest meat ever. Like I had rubber gloves on. I put it in a Rubbermaid and put it on a sled toboggan behind my snowmobile. You get one drop of that on you, it was like radioactive nuclear waste. If you put two drops of that in a vehicle, you wouldn't be able to sell it or get into the vehicle. That's how nasty it was. And if a cougar 
and her three kittens didn't come and feed off of all that disgusting shit until it was gone over the course of a couple weeks. Crazy, right? But anyways, what I'm getting at is, is cats are probably the easiest of the predators to bait. Bit of a spiel to get that statement out, right? So I would love to challenge you, any of you outdoors people listening in the South, just go establish a bait pile. Use what they're probably feeding on. Raccoon carcasses, deer carcasses, go get some roadkill. I know there's a lot of deer in the South, a lot of roadkill. Drive the highway, grab all that roadkill up, and just start a bait pile and maintain it. Right? M maintain, make a bunch of them though. You want to spread them out over a handful of miles. If you can, get some friends in on it with hunting properties, whatever. And um, bait those cats in and use trail cameras. Once the baits, don't put trail cameras there right away. Wait until it's getting chewed on by a predator, right? It's going to save you time of batteries and checking and SD cards and everything. And a lot of nothing. Make sure you set your trail cams not on the bait. Because if you set your trail cam on the bait, your birds are going to set off your camera non-stop. Literally multi-hundreds of times every 24 hours. Don't do it. Excuse me. You want to situate your bait so that what all the predators have to come in and leave in a few definite directions, meaning you're going to have some kind of a backstop, whether it be a down tree or rock wall or a river. A river, it would be really good. And then you want to set your cameras, at least three of them, on where you know if something's chewing on the bait, it has to take that trail to it. Because the birds are going to fly down onto the bait. The predator's got to walk in. So keep your cameras away from the bait on all of the possible routes. The predators are going to come to it. And then that's all you're going to get on your camera. It's going to save you a lot of time and grief and sifting through 10 million photos. Trust me, I've done it a million times. I've learned for you. Anyways, do it. Please do it. Somebody do it. Somebody do it. Get on your trail camera. It's not that hard if you specifically go to bait in cats. All right? If you do that, follow that recipe that I shared with you, you'll make it happen. And you know what? It, it, they might be rare enough. It could take you... It might take you months. Some people might get lucky in a week. It could take a couple of years. Right? Trust me, I've singled out individual deer where I hunt in the in the nasty ass British Columbia mountains here and I know I'm going to get a couple of particular bucks on my trail cameras but I know it's only going to happen maybe once a year right maybe twice a year maybe sometimes every second year and that's just a specific buck okay so don't give up once you start this don't give up and it's a fun thing to do with your kids too Get your kids out there in the woods and get them doing this project with you. It gets them enthusiastic, gets them learning the real world, gets them away from the screen, <laughs> right? Man, I wish I was in the South. I would put that, I would get a blow up video of the Black Panther. I know I would, because I wouldn't quit until I did. And I'd just keep working and figuring it out. Anyway, I've rambled enough. There you go, you guys. I'm out of here. Um. I'm out of here. I got so much to do. I'm behind in about 50 million emails, texts. Everybody's angry at me. People think I'm mad at them. As usual, whatever. I'm not. And I'll be back tomorrow. Did I already mention in the beginning that Sarah corrected me? We have fed 19 children and 7 adults in, in a 7-day period. There you go. That's from the people who joined the membership in the channel. Pat yourselves in the back.